So uh, it looks like Anamika is traveling and she'll try to make it whenever she has a stable connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also um, Leon is traveling to, uh, he's currently in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, he mentioned that he would try to be joining us, but he wasn't able to uh, control his schedule. Okay. <laughs> we know how that works when you're on abroad. Yeah. So uh, we are 10 of us now in principle, I would say we could begin unless you want to like maybe wait a couple of more minutes. Um, nah, there is already a nice group of people being online with us. So also just for not creating a habit, uh, starting late always, maybe then it's uh, just also time for us to, uh, to, to start. Um, so uh, welcome uh, everybody, nice to, uh, to see, well, some nice group of people here. Um, in today's webinar in the TransPath Plan project, um, we have Denise Fancy. And Denise is a um, is a graduate of our uh, Water Management and Governance Master Program at IHC Delft, and uh, Denise uh, has done uh, in the last six months her research and successfully completed her MSc thesis research that I have here in my hand called Cultivating Change in Agroecosystems, a closer look at policy and practice to support wetlands transformations in Kenya. Um, she worked in Kenya in the Yala wetlands with the group of um, Professor Taka and uh, Risper, who is also here with us um, and produced some really nice uh, work that is worth sharing within uh, the project uh, team. Also because, of course, her work was done with the support of the project. And it's good to report a little bit back of that. Um, that being said, I would say uh, I give the floor to you, Denise. Um, let's take just a normal kind of approach. You present your work afterwards. There's time for questions. Um, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yap, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us and for the interest in this topic. And thanks to the Chanspat team for organizing this webinar and giving me a platform to really share my research. So thank you. Um, while I present, if you allow me, I'll briefly turn off my camera and then I will turn it back on at the end so we could have a good discussion, all right? Okay. So as I begin this presentation, let me start by painting a vivid picture for you. Imagine for a moment a pristine wetland in Kenya, teeming with life and providing invaluable ecosystem services. Now envision the sustainability challenges this delicate ecosystem faces from intensive human activities exacerbated by complex policy dynamics. This is the essence of my research titled Cultivating Change in Agroecosystems, which delves into the concept of transformation in the context of wetland social ecological systems and examines the influence of policies on their sustainability. Through a case study approach, for six months, I focused on the Yala wetland in Western Kenya, and I passionately investigated the interplay between policies and the conservation and management of this 17,500 hectare agroecosystem. And so today I'm really excited to share my findings with you. 
But before I do so, let me quickly outline the agenda for my presentation so you know what to expect. So during the next 15 minutes, I will cover three key areas that summarize my research. Firstly, I will provide an overview of the research question, objectives, and conceptual framework to highlight the overall aim and structure of the study. Next, I will discuss the research methodology I used in examining the case study. And finally, and as the focus of this presentation, I will share my findings on the influence of policies on the transformation of the Yala wetland. And so I really look forward to addressing your questions during the Q&A segment at the end. Without any further delay, let me proceed to part one of my presentation. So the main objective of this research is to understand the influence of policies on the transformation of wetland agroecosystems in Kenya. And in order to achieve this overarching objective, I identified three sub-objectives that allowed me to systematically explore the complex interactions between policies and the yellow wetland. And so the first sub-objective focuses on a policy analysis that assess transformation prospects. The second was to investigate local level practices and their impact on higher level policy making. The third, aimed at identifying lessons and recommendations for transformation pathways planning. In this context, the main research question guiding my study is what influence do policies on wetlands conservation and management have on the transformation of wetland agroecosystems? So now moving on to the conceptual framework. This is a visual representation of the framework I developed for this research. It is underpinned by key theoretical concepts. As you can see at the core is the concept of transformation, which really shows that transformation is an interaction between the interconnected policy system and wetland system. And it is characterized by six attributes proposed by Fideli et al. So these are restructuring, path shifting, innovative, multi-scale, system-wide, and persistent. The addition of multi-phase as the seventh characteristic accounts for the dynamic nature of policymaking, which often occurs in multiple phases or stages, with each phase building on the previous ones and leading to further changes. It recognizes that transformation processes involve iterative cycles of learning, experimentation, and adaptation. Building upon this, this framework also incorporates the concept of top-down and bottom-up policymaking, as indicated by the blue arrows in the diagram, where policy actions in one system really influences the other system and vice versa. So I will now provide an overview of the research methodology I use for this qualitative study. To address the research questions, I conducted a policy analysis, which was carried out in two phases. In the first phase, I used a multidimensional approach to assess separately the context content, processes, and actors involved in policymaking in both systems. And then in the second phase, I evaluated content of the county level policy to assess the potential for effecting transformation in the Yala wetland. And to support this policy analysis, I utilized four qualitative data collection methods. And in the first instance, I did a literature review on the concept of transformation and the role of policy. And that was really the starting point. Then I completed a document analysis focusing on the formal policy. For primary data collection, I carried out a field study in Kenya where I administered semi-structured interviews with key performance 
key informants, sorry, and conducted a field observation of the yellow wetland itself. So with the data collection completed, I proceeded to analyze the findings, which I will now present in the next slide. So the analysis reveals several key insights about the policy social ecological system as it relates to policy for conservation and management of the Yala wetland. So it became apparent very early on that the dynamics within and between the policy and the wetland system create a number of forces which have hindered transformation towards sustainability. I therefore recognize that any attempt to balance conservation with socioeconomic objectives is likely to be in what I would refer to as a tug of war with clashing interests. And here I'm talking about politics, community needs, development, and even natural events over which one will have a stronger influence on policy decisions. So politics as a clashing interest. From the literature review, Patterson et al. argued that politics interfere with every aspect of policymaking for transformations. In this case study, I recognize that there are notable similarities of politics affecting policymaking processes in the Yellow Wetland. And this was largely indicated by the decades of conflicts over natural resources and the delays in policymaking for and misalignment with environmental sustainability. In the report, I shared rich accounts of interviewees talking about the influence of politics on the policymaking processes. And I really shared these to highlight that escaping politics in pursuit of conservation toward a balanced social ecological transformation is really an unlikely feat. Because as long as there are those who are pro-conservation being powerfully opposed by those against, the battle with politics will persist. Then there are community needs which have also taken priority over conservation and restoration of the yellow wetland. This was evident in several instances. For example, the widespread agricultural land conversion by local residents and the overexploitation of the ecosystem resources. However, based on my field observation, it would appear that mo the most persistent reason for community needs taking priority over conservation and restoration is that basic human needs are not being met in these settlements, which really leaves no room for prioritizing conservation. And so, one could really imagine that faced with poverty, conservation does not share the same urgency. The need for amplifying conservation and ecosystem restoration towards sustainability also contends with the forces of foreign investments and large scale development projects. In the case study, this was seemingly the biggest challenge preventing a sustainable transformation. As these powerful policy alternatives appear more attractive to government authorities than the incentives to seriously pursue wetlands conservation and management. Among other reasons, this was made obvious from the ongoing government approved land conversion by agro investors. And the power relation that exists among the government actors, the investors, and the community members really show that actors have a lot of power to influence the policy processes and steer top down decisions largely to their benefit in reclaiming more and more land for commercial agricultural expansion. The need for prioritizing conservation and ecosystem restoration actions has also been sidelined by natural weather events. And here I'm also talking about flooding, droughts, and other consequences of climate change. And in the case study, this has created further policy challenges and slowed progress 
of wetlands conservation and management. Olson and Gelas explain that these ecological surprises tend to occur when there is a mismatch between institutions and ecosystem. According to these actors, there are tendency for people and institutions to resist change and persist in their current management and governance system, despite clear recognition that change is essential. But failing to respond to the feedback of the environment, these actors argue, will only lead to more disasters and suffering. So it was clear from the analysis that conservation plays a central part of the social ecological transformation process toward a sustainable wetland. However, with politics, community needs, development, and natural events having a stronger influence on policy decisions, conservation is currently fighting a losing battle in this case study. Jostling between these contenders, if environmental values remain secondary and inappropriately scaled policy measures are upheld, other wetland agroecosystems experiencing similar power dynamics will suffer the same fate as the Yala wetland. In conclusion, I will make a few statements that quickly answer my sub-research questions. And I will start by highlighting that while top-down influence policy aims to strike a balance between environmental and socioeconomic needs, its implementation in the yellow wetland has really led to some improvements but falls short of achieving sustainable development. The policy has not been effective in managing the wetlands ecological qualities and currently appears to have a stronger influence on urban development, which will further degrade the wetlands capacity to provide ecosystem services. There are diverse practices in the yellow wetland where multiple competing interests shape this densely populated ecosystem. The ongoing resource conflicts and collaborative land use planning processes provide an insight into what works and what does not. But it would appear that bottom up voices have not yet effectively reached higher levels of policymaking, with large agribusinesses holding more influence in driving policies that favor agricultural production. This results in unequal voices on the ground, characterizing agro-investors over the poor members of the community. While there was collaboration in the development of the land use plan, it is really unclear if this approach will be sustained. Currently, there appears to be an impasse in progressing beyond the policy formulation with ongoing court cases and delays, which would indicate a lack of a shared vision for wetlands conservation. There were several lessons learned from conducting this research. One of the main takeaway is that policy failures are likely to occur when simple short-term solutions are selected without considering the contextual factors affecting both the policy system and the wetland system. Understanding the complexities of transformation requires recognizing the importance of historic decisions that have shaped the context. It is therefore crucial to acknowledge and to consider this history, not only in terms of understanding ongoing processes, but also in terms of planning for future transformations. This brings me to the end of my presentation, and I will close by stating that successful transformation requires a multidimensional approach with inclusive decision making among top down and bottom up policymakers to steer wetland social ecological transformations towards a more sustainable future where a wetland and its communities can really thrive. Thank you. So I am now open for any questions. Thank you for your attention in listening to my presentation. 
Yes, thank you, Denise. And you stopped at the right time that my kids came home. So I had to say something back. <laughs> Are there any questions uh, from online? Well, there I have a question. Yeah, please, Andres, I think. Yeah, wait, let me do something because I'm looking now at the... Uh... Hey Denise, uh, uh, thanks for the for the presentation and congrats on a uh, great uh, thesis. Thank but you. I I had a, a question uh, about uh, sort of the conclusion that you make that uh, uh, other wetlands are following or are are likely to meet the same fate as the Yala wetland if. Uh, uh, if things don't change. Yeah. But I was curious, like, at least in Kenya, are there wetlands that are then still pristine in the sense as you painted it uh, in your opening uh, uh, words? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or are they all kind of like the Yala wetlands already? Um, so from my understanding, most of them are on that trajectory as the Yala wetland. I cannot speak totally to all wetlands in Kenya, but um, I know a lot of them are being cultivated, drained um, for the purpose of agricultural production. So if this continues along that path, my theory is that they will suffer similar fate as the Yala wetlands. Right. Yeah. But we have luckily our Kenyan partners who are um, specialists in wetlands um, online. So they should be able to tell you more if they can join the discussion and tell us more about wetlands in Kenya. Uh, to add more to, I don't know if you can hear me, you can hear me. Yes, Risper. Hi, Dr. Ondaik. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first, thank you very much, Denise, for the wonderful work you did and highlighting key issues in the yellow wetland. Yes. So to add to what Andres asked you is that uh, actually Yana wetland would say it's still better than what most wetlands in Kenya have gone through because we have wetlands in Kenya which have actually disappeared. So you mm -hmm. wouldn't know there was a wetland you just find uh, farmland mm -hmm. like maize plantation or vegetable plantation instead of a wetland. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, an increasing trend in Kenya and even in Uganda, where you have uh, wetland policies which are supposed to enable sustainable utilization of wetlands, the same trend is happening. So the main issue is cultivation of unsustainable cultivation of wetlands, especially within sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at Tanzania, the same issue, you look at Kenya, the same issue, Uganda, the same, and even Rwanda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So someone asked a chat question, I think. Oh, really? I am not seeing how that... You're yeah. muted, yeah. You're muted. Yes, yeah, so maybe we can uh, repeat the question out loud. So let me do that then. Uh, hello, Denise. Could you, throw more, could you throw more light on the differential, different scales of policies used for policy analysis? Were there evident contradictions at county level or at national level? Do such contradictions prove to be an impediment to bring about transformation within wetland eco ecosystems, agro ecosystems? I am not sure I understand the question quite clearly. Can you repeat it? It was breaking up a bit in the middle. Um, well, maybe you can yeah, read also the chat, but... Um, the interesting one of the things, of course, uh, in this case, is also that Kenya is, of course, rather decentrally organized with right. uh, decentralization to uh, county um, levels. And would you see contradictions between policy at national level and uh, at county 
level and what how does that influence maybe transformations at wetland agro ecosystems also because you looked at these bottom up and top down right. processes. Mm -hmm. so from what i understand most of the power is at the county level for wetlands conservation and management, though there are key legal instruments and structures at the national level that would guide um, these county level um, policy actions. So while there's more power there at the county level, it is within the environmental and management structure and the institutional framework at the national level. So they both work, as I understand it, um, together to help try and bring about transformations. Um, although what I would add is that perhaps if there is more um, influence from national level, then we could get closer to a sustainable transformation. So right now it's at county level. And in the case of the Yellow Wetland, we're seeing that there are two counties who really are in charge of the transformation process. So the conservation and management of the Yellow Wetland would extend across the Busia and the Siaya County. And so they share responsibility in bringing about the transformation. But I would think that if we are improving on the legal and institutional framework at the national level, we can perhaps um, achieve the transformation goals even faster. Yes, because you, you mentioned um, something about the, the, the big uh, agro businesses who yeah. do have connections, mm -hmm. also, I think, at higher levels. Right. Um, yeah. Yet, at the same time, of course, when we um, think about decentralized governance, uh, mm -hmm. it is, well, argued to, to, to better relate to local or bottom-up uh, needs and responsiveness to uh, local uh, needs. So mm -hmm. how does that relate to community and uh, maybe having access to county level government and these agribusiness who have connections also at county level, but maybe also higher up? Yeah, I from what, what I people tell you about that. Yeah, so based on my research with the Yellow Wetland, we could see really how stronger government support is given to agribusinesses. And so at times, and more often than not, you see a, con uh, a case where there's contradictions in the policy approach. So in one instance, you would see government saying that they support transformation and sustainable actions within the yellow wetland, yet they are also giving strong support to conversion of the wetland. So there's a case right now in court where more land is being given to a specific agro investor, despite the unsustainable agricultural practices. It's steered towards more um, development and urbanization and commercial agricultural production, even though in the policy itself, the Yala Land Use Plan um, is an example of that. They're saying they want to balance the, the activities and create sustainability. But on the other hand, how is the conversion of this wetland supporting that goal? And um, I'm not sure at the local level if there is a strong support from the government in empowering local voices. From what I can tell, this is not um, the case. When I'm speaking to the residents at the local level, they comment on how they're not getting strong support from the local government and national government. They don't get assistance in terms of um, their needs. And while these are not necessarily focused on conservation, it's still showing that there's not a strong um, relationship between local community needs and the the government actors okay i think um yaya and uh or jaya and emanuele have a rather similar kind of topic in their uh, questions uh would, did you also see 
uh, practices when conservation and community and community needs were going hand in hand. And, and that might relate to the collaborative approach that uh, is mentioned by Emanuele. Um, yes, there's this group called the Yala Ecosystem Site Support Group, and they work along with Nature Kenya, and they focus on conservation actions within the Yala wetlands specifically. And so that's an, a good example of where communities are working together to bring about positive conservation change within the Yala wetland. But it is not at a, the scale that it needs to be. And um, if, and this is coming also from the Yala Ecosystem Site Support Group, they're encouraging more of the community members to get involved so that the collaborative actions can be amplified. So it, it exists, but really it needs to be increased in terms of the conservation actions. Uh, Dennis, to add to what Dennis has said about conservation, sorry. Go on. Yes, Risper? Uh, somebody was talking, that's why I said go on. Or I just continue. Yes, please. Okay. So to add what you have said about uh, conservation groups within uh, the community members, because when we are having an interview with them, we realize that they have two voices. So when you, you talk to them as conservation group, they are talking about conservation of, of the Yala wetland or sustainable utilization of the Yala wetland. But now when you talk to them as a community, their priority changes immediately. They are like, this place, there's no there's no equitable allocation of land for agriculture within the wetland. So they kind of shifting their, their goal when it comes to conservation of the wetland. So at times they want conservation, but as a community members, if you ask them, the priority is meeting the community needs. So it's kind of, a, it will be very difficult to, to actually come up with a way in which we can at the same time have community needs met and at the same time have conservation. So somehow we'll have to find a way of striking a balance with the communities who speak two voices. We need conservation, but at the same time, there should be equity within the wetland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Risper. I think Andres wanted to uh, say something. That's, I think, the person that uh, interrupted in the beginning. Yeah, sorry. I'm no, a lazy, lazy typer, I think. <laughs> I, I, I wondered uh, the, uh, how, if you can say a little bit more about how strong this community authority is, uh, in the sense that it's possible that in a community there is this initiative to protect the wetlands, but if the community doesn't have the authority to 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 influence others or to make to make its members follow its initiative, then how do you think that uh, that that uh, uh, that transformation to sustainability or sustainable development of wetlands uh, can can happen? Yeah, so I think you highlighted one of the key issues in this case study, because really the top down policy actors, they have a stronger influence. And while there are some actions from the Yala Ecosystem Site Support Group, is it's not as influential as the government actors who really have the resources and the legal um, authority to steer the transformation of the Yala wetland toward more reclamation than sustainability. So you're right in saying that um, we're questioning the, the, the strength of the authorities at the local level. It's really not balanced. And so if there is to be a change towards sustainable transformation, then I would recommend that voices from local levels uh, be empowered 
to create um, stronger actions um, within the Yala wetland. At the moment, that is not the case. As far maybe, as I maybe, understand it. Yes, I think I mean something uh, a bit different. Okay. Oh, not in comparison to uh, to national or uh, 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 county actors, mm -hmm. but the community itself. Mm -hmm. the community, what kind of decisions can they make, or what kind of actions do they uh, perform, where all members sort of have to oblige? For example, yeah. uh, pay taxes or uh, administer. Uh, some kind of title or access to land and if that is the case how are, are the members respecting that authority is is the question clear the second half no because i for example i live in uh, amsterdam and if my municipality says andres don't walk on the grass then me and half of amsterdam don't listen to amsterdam authority so they have come up with all kinds of legal instruments that go beyond the municipality to give me fines if I uh, break those rules. Mm -hmm. But that is then difficult to create something locally. There are also places where you go and that community authority is so strong that if the community authority says don't do it, people don't do it, they listen or they follow that authority more than the national one. So how... Mm -hmm. What happens locally that communities can contribute to that transformation that you see? Hmm. That's a tough question for me. Um, Risper, would you be able to help me here? Um, when it comes to, let me say like, when it comes to land in Kenya, let's say like the wetland itself, the wetland, in real sense, it belongs to the community. But in reality, because it said that the wetland is a community land, but in reality, since the wetland has not been uh, uh, written down or has, a law has not been passed that Shiala wetland belongs to the community, the wetland now belongs to the county government. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, in most cases, the county government who, deci who decides what activities and how the land within the wetland should be used. And also uh, the national authorities, like uh, those ones dealing with the environment and water, looks on um, the quantity of water, how it's being extracted within the wetland. But mm -hmm. the community per se, I would say that they have a responsibility or a legal responsibility within the wetland, apart from just the general one of the environment that you should, you should conserve the environment around you. But they don't have a real voice when it comes to how the wetland should be used. Because even mm -hmm. those who have the wetlands, their lands close to the wetland, they're using the wetland illegally. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot say that the wetland belongs to you. Yes, you are cultivating it for agriculture or whatever, but, uh, it doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. So they don't have title deeds, but there are some places in Kenya where people have enforced the wetland and through Boga's ways or through illegalities, they have obtained title deeds. So they can actually say, this is how we can use this part of the wetland and they can actually influence policies within those areas. But that is also illegally acquired title deeds. Mm -hmm. But when, when it comes to uses like, Extracting papyrus, that is now a public good. You can you can you can harvest papyrus from a wetland, you can get water from a wetland for community use. But if you want to use it now for commercial use, you'll have to go through authorities which will uh, give you a license on how much you can extract from a wetland. But generally mm. the communities do not have a voice on how to use the wetland. Mm. Mm -hmm. And do do you uh can I ask another question now? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do you, uh, do I, if I understood you, there are cases where uh, communities, legally or not, have sort of obtained a, uh, a, a title uh, deed or title document about a particular wetland. So yes. that the community is the, the sort of the owner. 
if we can say that. Actually, it's not the community, but an individual. Let's say like you, somehow you found a way of getting a piece of a wetland. So it's just, you know, the community. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Then, because then I, I thought it would be interesting to see what differences in terms of uh, of initiatives to con to conserve it from a, from a local uh, uh, perspective, if the community actually had a stake there as a yeah, collective, yeah. which they yeah. which it seems that they have not. Yeah, it it will be a different world game if the community actually have a stake in the wetland legally. Yeah. Then they could actually have a voice on saying that. We can conserve this amount of the wetland, but right now it's just through, uh, let me say, formal engagement that the community, like the land use plan within the wetland, they say that the community were engaged, which is required by the law. Mm -hmm. And they say that this is the amount of the wetland we should be used for agriculture, this one will be conserved. But in real sense, that is what is written in the document, but in the real sense, politics has taken over and there are people who are being prioritized, like the private investors who are being prioritized mm. when the utilization of the wetland and the mm. community are now left out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they're fighting for. For example, the Lake Kennebole, um community, they really want um, a bigger area within the yellow wetland so that they can really use it for the benefit of the community. And so that's one of the issues they have with the agro investor being allotted all this land. And they're saying by the time the lease is up, what will be left there for them? There's nothing um, for to be conserved at the end of that um, lease. So yeah, they don't really yeah, yeah. have the power. They just have to accept um, and be involved in the policy making process as much as they are allowed by the government. Yeah, it's then also not per se said that these uh, community members uh, would like to conserve and preserve it, the wetland. They would at the same time maybe also want to reclaim it for agricultural production. That's exactly yeah. it. Um, <laughs> that is so, the priority. What is, I, that so, is what is fair. I think interesting is. Then, then it becomes a local political issue, right? It is because then you have like part of the community that wants to uh, that has that initiative that Denise uh, uh, just explained, and others mm -hmm. might have different ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but now they are kind of circumventing the the the, the community authority and to what level it exists and the initiative because they can just talk to national politicians. Yeah. So that there are the the cases in Latin America then where you need community consent before you can uh, give land away for whatever kind of land use that is not already there, mm -hmm. and that 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 also like a, a, a prevents these things from happening uh, uh, maybe, but well, mm -hmm. for another case. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe that uh, is a nice bridge as well to the, the question of uh, uh, Gitima or Gitima. Um, did you did your work also include the perspective of policymakers at all levels towards wetlands conservation? So maybe this is more maybe what is then the perspective of higher level policymakers? And maybe because you I think also talk with people from the National Environmental Management Authority. Mm -hmm. So how are they looking? at this what is their perspective on the wetland conservation so what maybe needs to be done for a more sustainable transformation so what i noticed at all levels of um, policy making was that there were multiple perspectives um, if we're talking about the nema there are at um, national and subnational levels um, you'll see in the legal requirement that there is a need to do a environmental impact assessment every time a proposed project um, is, is um, being considered, but at times that is not 
the case. It doesn't happen always. And so on one side, you'll have the perspective of Nima saying this needs to be prioritized, this needs to happen, conservation is important and we need to protect our um, environment. But on the other hand, um, based on the interviews I've had, it's um, in some instances, even though they are recommending that the project doesn't proceed, then an approval is granted either way at the national level um, from NEMA itself. So there's two perspectives depending on the level of politics in it. Um, and that exists um, for all policy actors, all groups of policy actors I've noticed. So even at the community level, you'll have those who are in support of conservation and those who are really looking out for their individual or um, group benefits, um, which is not in alignment with conservation. But yes, I did interview um, and considered all levels of um, policy actors from top down to bottom up. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but maybe you could tell me what part is still needing clarity. No, I think I think it's fair a fair answer to the question, but um, well, although I'm not sure I am the one to judge. Um, but would you? Uh, so in you you mentioned also in your um, framework on transformations and uh, how this restructuring, multi-scale path shifting, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but that that other part system system wide that there is not a system wide idea of what is the desired kind of uh, situation for such a wetland. Yeah. So that different we have different departments uh, from different uh, or line agencies from different ministries, different policy domains uh, from mm -hmm. agriculture to uh, nature conservation, etc. Mm -hmm. Who all have different ideas about the use of these wetlands, but also within at a local scale within mm -hmm. the community that there is uh, some community members also want to convert to agricultural uh, production and use of the wetlands others might want to conserve because it enables them for fisheries i don't know but to, have mm -hmm. to sustain their livelihood mm -hmm. but that there is simply no agreed kind of idea about uh, what would be the ideal situation for uh, or a, a sustainable use of the system and therefore there is well a scattered kind of development yeah. mm -hmm. What was the question? Sorry. Well, I'm not sure. I don't think there is actually a question <laughs> for that for some sort of a, a yeah, thing. there's no shared vision, absolutely. That's the conclusion I um drew from all of this. It would be good if there is, and um, which is why at the end I really recommend that all policy actors find a way to collaborate more and come up with some solution that is giving benefits to some well, all actors, but really prioritizing conservation because right now everybody's just using the yellow wetland for whatever personal gains. And that is dominated at the moment by the agro investors who are really supported by the top down, top up, the government actors, sorry. Yeah, so no shared vision. Can I can I have a? Uh, I'm curious about something related. Yeah. So we're talking about wetlands. I don't know Kenya, but in Kenya you also have national parks. I think grasslands or rangelands, forests. Uh, uh, are all of these in the hands of the state? So are all of these in the hands of uh, uh, this all public property, or do, do uh, communities or or tribes or something have have a kind of claim over that and the a kind of decision making power over that. the belief from the community is that it's community land but in actuality um i'm not sure that that's really the case risper can more speak to the other wetlands maybe okay. uh if we define the 
wetland widely including the lakes and the rivers and the, the yala the marshes and everything else in the national parks maybe uh the land let's say like a uh, lake victoria doesn't belong to the community living close to lake victoria generally it belongs to the government mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. so most land if it is not a privately owned land it, it belongs to the government so the community can stay close to it, but it doesn't mean that it belongs to them legally. It mm. belongs to the government, but they can benefit from it because somehow it belongs in their land. The wetland is in their land, so somehow they can benefit from the activities. They should benefit, not they can. They should benefit from the activities which are taking place within those wetlands. For instance, if there's an investor in the wetland, like the Yala wetland, a private investor, which has been brought by the government, the government or the, the county government should ensure that the community around that area benefit in terms of jobs or incentives, something like that. That is how it should be, but at times it's not the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Yala Ecosystem Site Support Group were um, sharing their story about how they don't really feel that they're benefiting from the current agro investor. Um, and they were speaking specifically um, in terms of the sugarcane production and how the agro investor brings in um, their own workers and then they the cane is processed at mills that are located outside of the community and it's not really um, benefiting them so they feel like they're being robbed and it's um, community land as they see it, but they're not really getting any major gains from it. So. Mm -hmm. so generally land in Kenya doesn't belong to somebody, but you can use it, but it doesn't belong to you. Yeah. For a water body. It belongs to the government. To the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, so is it the national government or the local government? I mean, that is, just, I think, just interesting also to compare across cases. I would say national. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, Gen yeah, generally it belongs to the national government, but when now you come to locally, it belongs to the county government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Depending, depending on the jurisdiction, if it is this county, then it belongs to that county government. But generally, the national government mm -hmm. is in charge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry for insisting. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andres. Yeah, it, it sounds a bit like um, uh, a, a tragedy of commons uh, kind of story as well. Right? But, uh, yeah. The public uh, commons, the public goods that are. Uh, uh, well, it, it is actually, no, in a way, it is not, in the sense that uh, the the effective way to avoid it would be to have either state control or private property. And the idea is that if you would give it to a collective, to a community, mm -hmm. then that would be held in common, and that would then be uh, 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 doomed to fail. Yeah, but now it's it's it looks almost that it falls all in between. All in yeah. between, yeah. Yeah, but the question now is who is the community? Who is the community? <laughs> no, but if yeah. yeah, if you cannot, it, that should be. Yeah. I don't know how. But if that is difficult to answer, then mm -hmm. I think that is also a sign that there is not a strong authority. If yeah. you immediately yeah. know, then mm -hmm. then you have come across locally established, well organized that already has its root in that area organization mm -hmm. that can that can uh, it can rival these other actors that you talked about. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and then it results in these actors acting privately. So if private agro owners, but also private uh, actors that uh, also then claim land for reclamation. And, uh, and then you see, well, all kinds, well, invisible hands that's steering in this case, not to a sustainable kind of practice. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. 
Um, we are almost at um, 4 p.m. Um, so I would like to ask, are there any final questions maybe? If not, then I'm going to uh, thank you, Denise, for your presentation and sharing your uh, work thank with you. us. Um, we will make sure that uh, this is also available to the, uh, the, the wider uh, project team. So thank you very much. Also, uh, thank you, of course, to the Canyon project partners that facilitated uh, mm -hmm. your work. So mm -hmm. thank you, Risper and uh, mm -hmm. your colleagues. Um, I think before the project meeting in Mexico, there's not another um, uh, a webinar scheduled, but if so, um, well, our colleagues will inform us about it. And um, in relation to Delhi, her question, I will share Denise her presentation to you by email. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I close this webinar. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. joining and for your interesting questions and discussion. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.